Hey everyone, Maury Curtis Dunbar here. Welcome back to Painted Studio. We are finishing our bunnies up today. I'm just getting all my camera stuff set up so that I can see you but not hear myself. Let's get all the everything turned on so I can read what's going on. And it has been a little over an hour, so we are finishing up with all our bunnies and our egg and everything else, and we're going to discuss the different ways to finish this. Now, what I'm showing you and what we've been doing are actually furniture finishes. Yes, I am doing these on small items. Makes it easy to demonstrate on, but a lot of the techniques that we are using are very similar to what is used on furniture to give them that old vintage look. And so I suggest not only enjoying it for craft stuff, but looking at it for your next furniture project. All right, so I'm gonna flip this camera down, hopefully not do something dumb and have it go someplace strange, because I can do that. Let's angle the camera down a little bit. Let's pull it up on the air a little bit. Let's hope that stays. Let me get a check to make sure I'm good with where it is. And I think eh, straighten things out just a little bit. You don't you want to see more of what's going on and less of me, I'm sure. <laughs> Sorry, it just takes a minute, you know, the, it, unlike with an iPhone where everything flipped up and down with the Mevo, I have to move it, check it, then assure that I got it in the right place, and then move it again. There we go. I think we're a little better that way. There we go. So it just takes a minute. So let's get our less than tidy piece of papers off of here. Whoops. Let's not bowl things across the table. All right. And this is parchment paper. I use this stuff all the time um, for my projects because it actually is uh, water resistant. It allows me to put things on here and they don't stick and we have good results. All right, so we're going to start with sanding. Old World Finishing Paint, now known as Layering Paint by Fofex. As you saw in my demo earlier, sands like a dream. Really easy. Now, it still feels a little cool, so it might be a little damp. We might not get it sanding as easily, but we're going to get some really great results here. So the first thing I want to do to give a little vintage distress to it is I'm going to go all around the edges to expose that orange sunset color that was underneath. When you distress, you want to take a minute and think about what you're doing. Distressing happens where things naturally rub. So you don't distress in chicken, you know, in, in dots all over the thing to the point where it looks like it has measles. You think about how things rub out, wear away, and it's usually on the edges and on high points. So the first thing we're going to do is get all of these high points around the edges, give it a nice little bit of distress. Things will tend to wear maybe at the base just a little more because of the way people handle things. We want to get all of these edges because that is the look I'm going for. And if you can see that, that is, I don't think you can see that, but I can tell you when you touch it, it's like velvet. It sands just so beautifully. I'm going to get any lumpy spots along these edges sanded out. And then we're going to go into the center and you're going to see what I was accomplishing by putting uh, a texture roller through this. First, we got to get all the other spots because I like to do the really pretty stuff last. It's like my reward for doing all the other stuff I don't want to do. Okay, and um, I sweep the dust off into my hand. I have a garbage bag next to me. I'm trying not to make a huge dusty mess. All right, let's see if I got what I wanted dusted down, sanded down. Let's get right in here too. Again, 
places where things get handled are going to be where the distressing shows the most. Okay, so on here there is texture. If you look closely, you can see the faint pattern where the roller went through. We're going to make that a lot more obvious. And I'm sanding lightly because I don't want to sand through the whole thing and kill the work that I'm doing. And I'll sand in both directions because it won't hurt this. I'm not sanding grain, I'm sanding paint. So as you can see, the pattern is slowly starting to emerge here, giving a really wonderful vintagey texture to it. Look how pretty that looks. And as I sand, it becomes velvet smooth. Put that back. And look how old and antique that's starting to look. Now don't go too crazy. Only sand as much as you want exposed. Because if I just keep sanding at this, I'm going to sand all of the yellow off, which I don't want to do. And we're going to go back down to ground zero with orange. Look how beautiful that is. I love that so much. So I'm going to sweep this off. Now, if I wasn't doing a live, I'd tell you put on a particle mask. If I put on a particle mask during a live, you can't understand me. Trust me, I've tried. I've tried, really. And you don't want it to look perfect. Perfect looks machine made. We are creating hand finishes. So look at how beautiful would that look on, say, a dresser drawer or a cabinet front. It would look so wonderful and so old. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go on this side. We're going to do the same thing. Again, sanding gently. Don't get aggressive with this. Don't get impatient. And use a finer grit. This is 220. If you start using something like 150 or, God forbid, 80, you cut through all the paint and be down to orange and wood in no time. Which is fine if that's what you want, but if it's not what you want, don't do it that way. Oh, so pretty. I love this. You could mount the, uh, uh, a shim or a wooden door wedge on there and think about what a great do looking doorstop that would make, not just decor. This is so beautiful. Oh, I haven't done one of these in a while, so I, every time I do something like this, I get all excited again because it's been a while. It's made me miss it. It has almost an old damask drapery look to it. Look how beautiful that looks. I am, I am so pleased with that. And that's all I'm going to do on the sanding of that. We're going to pull this all off the table. Clean that up. Whew. And we're going to sand our little white bunny. Now this one, we're going to sand a lot more of. And you're going to start to see why I did the dings and hits on this because it will start showing little stressed highlights in here where the paint receded into those hit marks that I put on there. I mean, I don't know what to call them other than hit marks. I mean, the places where I hit it. Uh, I got to clean that up down there because, yeah, ooh, that's still wet right there. 
I applied it really thick and it got gooey, but I can also wet distress there too. So let's get this done first. So I want to focus more on the center and removing more in the center on this. Look how charming this is. Just antique -y, old looking, wonderful. Hey Kay, nice to see you here. And Nilgun, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And Shelly, thanks for popping in. So we're just sanding back this old world finishing paint and going down to get a little bit of old, distressed whitewashed look on here and you can see this side this is where i kept knocking it over you kept seeing me knock it over so it's pretty messy looking but i guarantee by the time i finish with it it won't look like that so let's come in and sand it here And now you see all these little pock marks, these little white spots. That is where I was hitting them, hitting this with the rock before. And it gives this wonderful distressed look to it. Now, as you can see, the edges are pretty beat up. I was very sloppy with the paint. I'm gonna show you how to handle that if you don't wanna sand it, although I will sand the bottom of this, just cause I wanna make sure it's good and smooth. There we go. And as you remember, we stained this with, um, Saman water-based stain in American walnut. So now I'm going to take a little bucket with water. That's all that's in there, nothing else. And I'm going to come back in and I'm going to wet it down. And I'm going to remove some of the paint. And what happens when I use water, it's a little more aggressive to remove paint. But it's also faster. So I'll go off on the surface and side too to remove some of the paint. But I wanted to get a soft, even finish there first. But I need to get these edges. And once you find your rags getting a little gummed up with paint, you just move to another spot, go in here, wipe it down. And the idea is not to make it look perfect. You want it to look old and distressed. Sort of like me some days. <laughs> I look old and distressed a lot of days. So look how beautifully this is taking all of that white back. And when you can't get in there with your finger, you take the rag, you fold it up, you go in like this, and it massage it a little bit. You can wrap the rag on a piece of stick, do whatever you need to do. But this gives it sort of a wonderful vintage, it's been in my grandmother's closet look this very cool look and now you can see it's wet here where my hands were we're also going to come back and just in the middle take a little bit of this out not not a lot because i don't want to lose all the white 
I just want to make sure I get a little feel for a little more darkness there. And that is done with the distressing part. Now it has to dry a minute and it will lighten up as it dries because I've wet that chalk paint down and it needs just a little dry time, although I do need to badly get right there. There is a big glob that I don't like right there on the inside of that ear. Oh, much better, much better. Take the globs down. Don't leave your piece messy. And see how it's drying already? And it's got this beautiful, soft, whitewashed, vintage look. I really, really love how that is. So pretty. So, so pretty. So again, we're going to set that to the side. And we're going to put both of these way over to the side because I need to be very aggressive with the pink one. And I don't want to get a lot of water on the other one. So we're going to wet distress this whole thing. Before we wet distress, though, I want to get up here behind this ear, give it a little sand. Bottom, just so I get the edges nice and smooth, even if I choose not to distress it too much more. But I don't want any odd buildup. Okay, so here's where we're going with this. We're going to start rubbing through the pink to get to the red that will then get to the wood. I'm going to start here, and now you can see that wood is starting to show. We're actually going to have sort of pinkish red wood, but we're not going to be done with that. That's not going to be the final look. Now with the way I'm doing this, this with the... Uh, rag this way. This actually gives me some more control so I'm not sanding the entire surface. I'm simply distressing where I want it to be distressed. And again, as you see where I hit it with the rock, the light pink has grabbed in and we're not losing it as I rub through the pink and get to the red. And then we're not even losing it as I go through the red to get to the wood. These are very, very old furniture techniques. Um, if you've gone and ever seen something that's a new piece of furniture that has this sort of distressed look, this is how they get it. You know, they, they get through in layers, but they use a lot of really aggressive solvent chemicals. We're doing this with water and mineral paint, which is just beautiful. And you know, the really nice thing is, if you hate the way you distressed it, you can put more paint on here, it won't hurt anything. this side. I need some more water. Now my water is warm. I personally find warm water makes this work better. Let's see if anybody's got any questions. Hey Martha, thanks for popping in. And Kay and everybody else who's popped in with us, thank you so much. It's my second live today and <laughs> quite frankly, it's, I'm trying to make up for missing you all so much in the last week since we had no heat in here. We just couldn't operate anything other than shipping. The studio never got much above 50 degrees for about a week. But we have heat. We have heat. Okay, so I'm going to keep rubbing and removing this. And now you might understand why I said don't 
you know, smooth, even layers, but don't make yourself crazy applying this thick because as I'm removing it, I'm taking off as much product, almost as much product as I put on. And so if you put it on really, really super thick just to remove it, that's kind of wasteful. I hate wasting product. That's a personal thing. So if I can find ways to do it, and I've done these, this is a cool technique, and I've done this with multiple layers of multiple rub throughs, getting something to actually look like marble. And maybe we'll do that on something else another day. If I can go find some other cool cutout, I'll make it look like marble. And I need some, I want to do it on something thick like this because I love how these wood, thick, thick old wood cutout. This makes it look much more authentic. I need the sandpaper right here where it got built up behind the bunny ears. I want to smooth that a little bit. And every time I teach this technique to people, they're like, oh, well, mine looks so sloppy, even when they get finished with the rub through. And it's going to look a little funky when you're finishing with the rub through. That's just the nature of it. But I'm going to tell you what, we're going to fix it so it doesn't. You're going to be amazed at the transformations that are going to happen as soon as we finish doing these rub throughs. So now you can see all those little distress spots. It grabbed the light pink in here. Some of the darker spots, here's where it grabbed the dark red. So if you look here, it's the light pink. If you look here, it's the dark red. That's why we hammered at different levels all the way through applying this paint. And you do want, for something like this, now if you're doing a fine piece of furniture, you might not want it to look like this. But if you're trying to make something that looks like an antique toy, scruffy looking paint along the edges is very appropriate because, you know, think about toys that you might have seen around for a while. They get beat up on the paint. Somebody decides to paint it. They paint it over badly. This is part of the technique. Okay, and keep moving to clean areas of the cloth because if you start keep rubbing with a area that's like this and this all that happens is that the paint that you rubbed off from one spot and you moved over to another you're depositing the paint over there you're not cleaning it off you're just moving it around so you really want to make sure you're moving your towel to clean areas and re-wetting and then moving it around flipping the spots back and forth. Now I'm definitely picture framing this, meaning I'm leaving a ring of col lighter color around the edges. That was my intention with that. this. That's what I want to have happen. If you don't like that, say, remove some of the edging. You know, smooth it out, remove some of the edging. I want that sort of worn in the center look. It is not a typical way to distress. It's the way I'm choosing to distress this piece. Also, you just watched me kind of arc that rub there. Come back, soften it up. Make it look a little more natural the way it's rubbed away. So you can see on this side, we're starting to see a lot more of the wood under here. I'm going to come back on this side and remove a little more red. So we see even more of that wood come through. All right, we're going to set that aside and let that dry off for a minute. And the next thing we're going to do is start sealing or toning. So the easiest way to seal up something like this because everybody loves it is using wax now the thing you need to remember with wax wax is when it's a true wax like we're going to use this is a product that's not made anymore this is fofex old world venetian wax but we have other waxes like liberons we have other things that we're knocking over but we have other true waxes like liberon or 
uh, Brie wax or any of those other waxes. Those are true solvent based waxes. That's why they smell a little like shoe polish. Um, you have to realize that that is the final coat. It's not something you can paint over. If you want to wax something, if you want a, a finish that you can paint over and you still want to wax, then I highly suggest you use a top coat and then wax because then you can strip the wax easily off of the top coat. But if you're doing it like I'm going to do this where it's going to actually penetrate the wood, you can't just strip that off with like sanding it because sanding heats the wax and then pushes it further into the grain of the wood. And we're just going to use a plain clear wax on this one. This just happens to be the one. I, God, I love the smell of this stuff. I know some people hate the smell. I absolutely love the smell of wax. I actually had a client who asked me to do Venetian plasters in her house just so that her house would smell like this wax for a couple days. I said, you know, that that comes off, don't you? That, that, that solvent smell goes away. And she's like, I know, but I need to have it for a little while anyway. I mean, we, we probably all gave each other brain damage doing some of the stuff we did back in the day. All right, so I'm going to take some wax and we're going to buff it in. As you can see, the wax will soak in and it's going to darken it a little bit. It will not stay this dark because as the solvents evaporate, it'll lighten back up a little bit. So you wax the entire surface. In my case, for this, whatever I can freaking reach. And I'll take a, yeah, I can take a paintbrush or a stick or something, wrap it around my rag and get up into the crevices. But you want to get the whole surface and you want to wax with a soft cloth. This is our um, litless cheesecloth, which is ideal for waxing because then you don't leave a linty residue behind. And trust me, if you've ever worked with cheesecloth that has lint in it, damn, that's a mess to deal with because it gets embedded and caught on stuff. And oh, what a mess. So now we have this beautiful vintagey look. I want to grab that little bit of stuff there. And you need to let this dry um, until it goes dull. Usually that's, you know, anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes. Think about polishing shoes. Uh, let it dry. And then you come back and buff it. So we're going to set that to the side. And we're going to work on... Our egg and we're going to use two waxes on this one I'm going to show you how so I love this as it is but we're going to wax it because I know a lot of people get confused with waxing so we're going to cover how you do different waxes we're clear waxing first oh my gosh look how that took it made it look even older even richer <laughs> this is an easy surface to wax I mean it's an oval so this will take no time to do. All right. But say I wanted to go a little darker around the edges. Get, make it a little bit older, crustier looking. So I have here, I have some old Liberon Tudor oak wax. Now, let me see if I can find something to open it because I just cleaned all the tools off the desk that I would normally use trying to make room for myself. The more efficient I get, the less efficient I get. So look how beautiful that is already with this wax on it, deep and rich here. But while that's still wet, we're going to open that up, and that's very, very dark. This is very little left in here, Tudor oak. And I'm going to take a waxing brush, and you can use a chip brush. You don't have to buy special waxing brushes to do this. I just happen to have this. So I'm going to test this here, see how much I've got on here. Keep it light, and 
I'm going to go right, swirl it at the edges a little bit. You don't want to go, unless you're really trying to get something dark, you don't want to go right in with your dark wax. You want to wax light first. You want to go carefully and delicately. Oh, this is so pretty. And be gentle-handed. If you go in here with a big blob on this, you'll lose everything, all the nice detail that you work to create. And you're going to sort of rouge it in. Rouging is a phrase that comes, it's a French phrase that we all know it, that blusher used to be called rouge. And rouging is this motion. It's rubbing it and spreading it. And this really gives it a nice antique kind of patina. And then we're going to take a little more. Again, I keep offloading my brush so I don't get too much. And it gives it sort of an older, crustier look to it. A little more worn. I want to make sure it looks like it's been around for a while. And then we're going to take the other side, come back with a little more here. And you have to sort of think about how dirt and crust builds up on stuff. So it's usually going to be at the base where it's been sitting on something where the dust might build up or at the top where it might be handled more. And look how pretty that looks. <laughs> I laugh because as finishers, we create looks that people used to want to clean out of their house. But with people wanting things to look really old and vintage, we had to come up with ways to do it that would mimic age without um, actually making something dirty. So I'm going to do that up there. So we still have this lovely rich yellow in the center, but we kind of got a little halo of crustiness on either side. And again, we're going to set that aside and let it dry. We'll come back and polish it, get it to a lovely sheen. So now you've been waxed with plain wax. You've waxed with clear wax, plain, clear or plain wax, and then a little dark wax to get some accents in there. That kind of waxing also, we did this, we were doing this on a flat surface, but if you wanted, let's get that rubbed out. If you wanted to do this in like a dresser, you take the wax, after you've clear waxed, you take the dark wax and put it into the little crevices and come and wipe it back before it hardens. Okay, now here is our bunny back and he's fairly dry. I got to make sure I wipe my hands down on my apron so that I don't have a lot of waxy fingers going on here. And we're going to take a container. Oh, one more thing. When you're using waxes, especially solvent-based waxes, open them up wide. You want the solvent to dissipate. If you leave them wadded up like this somewhere and it's left tight like this, this will combust. This stuff is combustible. Don't stick it on a heater. Normally what I do is I will take, if I can't get this and air it out in time before I have to leave a space, I will take these rags and put them in a plastic container full of water. Metal container is better so that they don't combust. And then I set them outside in the middle of the parking lot behind my studio because I'm having had my house burned down. I'm, a, I'm I have a, a paranoia of fire, but truly I can also do one other thing. I've got my can of paste wax here. Okay. We're sealed. I can take my rag, close it in that. It's now airtight and sealed. It will not combust. So there, those are a couple options. Make sure you take care of your combustible items. That is the one thing I will tell you about true solvent born waxes. You have to, have to, have to pay attention to that sort of thing. You don't want to have anything bad happen. Okay, so for this one, we're going to glaze it. Now, I know everybody's, what's the deal with glaze? Glaze is for toning. Um, and there's a lot of, can I glaze over top coat? Can I glaze under top? I'm going to teach you traditional glazing for furniture. 
So this is uh, Artsy Fill Glazing Medium. I've used this all the time. It's wonderful. And then I'm going to add to it some colorant. Now, if you don't want to wax, but you want to glaze, you can glaze clear. And all that's going to do is have a darkening effect on it and sealing this paint all the way through. But I don't normally glaze if I'm not adding color because I'll just top coat. Then I'm going to add some colorant to it. This is asphaltum transoxide. And you're going to watch me go, God, that's going to be really dark. And you're right, it is. But it's glaze. It will wipe back. So I'm making this beautiful, rich brown glaze. And you don't have to make your glaze as dense as I just did. If you only want a little bit of color change, make it sheerer. And it will look very similar, sheer or not. So here's how you test the density of the color of your glaze. On a white surface like I have here, take this, put it on there, smear it across. That's the density I want. If I wanted it sheerer, this would look much like a lighter brown. If I wanted it darker, it would be much darker brown just spreading it across like that. So I'm going to take a brush and I'm going to grab my cheesecloth because this is going to take a bunch of cheesecloth. And again, you want lint-free cheesecloth. If you don't know where to get it, we carry it. It's under tools, I think. Tools and or just search cheesecloth. And this is the other thing with glazing. Don't take one little piece of cheesecloth and wad it up. Take a couple and make a pad because you don't want to have your fingerprints and your finger marks showing through. You want it to be consistent. So let me grab a brush that would be good for this. Here we go. Now this is normal, a little smaller than I normally use. Yeah, I'm not going to use that one. I don't want that small. This is what I want. So first we're going to start on the sides. And before anybody asks, can you glaze over wax? No, not over true wax. True wax, like solvent born, like beeswax, is the final coat. It is a water resistant top coat. The reason it was used for so long is very simple. It was the top coat they had before they had other top coats. It sealed up the wood, protected it against moisture. So if you're going to put something water-based over wax, even solvent-based over wax, it's going to resist it. So you're not going to be happy with that. So first we're going to wipe this back here. And now you can see we're getting sort of a nice vintage kind of pink on here. And again, I'm not as worried about the sides. I just want to get them sealed up before I do the rest of this and have any issues. Glaze has very long open time. It gives you plenty of time to work and manipulate on your surface. That's the point of it. That's why you use glazes on things instead of top coats. When you're toning something, you want some work time. If I did this with a top coat, it would already be drying up and getting sticky as I'm working. This has plenty of work time, which is exactly what I need when I'm toning because I'm going to need to manipulate it, come back, wipe it back a little more, see whether I like it. See, I got a little pigment right in there. I'm just blending it with my brush. Little spot that I missed with when I was stirring it up. Okay, so you can come in, you can pounce it if you don't want to remove a lot or you can come back and wipe back more. And what I love about this is it picks up the wood grain, tones down those candy colors that we were looking at, makes it look lovely and old. And it's quick. wipe up that spot so that when I put the other side down, <laughs> I don't get big old smears on it. Okay. Now I'm being generous with the glaze right now. Normally I don't apply it this heavy, but I want you to be able to see what I'm doing clearly. So yeah, I'm being aggressive with the glaze on here. 
And again, wiping it back. I'm wiping back gently because I can still remove the chalk paints, the layering paints that are on here when I'm glazing if I get aggressive with it. What I really want to do is have it sit in there and tone it and start looking old. Look how pretty that is. Oh, so pretty. Oh, so pretty. Oh, I love that. And we're really getting this antique toy look out of it, which is very much what I want. Now this, I will not be able to do another thing too because it has to dry until the, you know, sit and dry with the glaze on it, except where I get, and I missed it, so I gotta get in there. So give it a good overnight to dry, maybe longer, because the glaze will be, especially if you're somewhere where it's really humid. Now, glaze is, works differently in different areas. Glaze can be fast drying and need extender if you're in some place like Arizona, and very slow drying if you're in some place like old Louisiana where it's hot and humid. So you have to pay attention. If you know what your weather is, that makes a difference. We're pretty humid here, but cold right now. So that means I'm gonna be a little slow for the glaze to dry. So I'll probably come and top coat this on Monday. And I will top coat it because glaze is not a top coat. Glaze is like a toning layer. Thinking of, you know, if you get your hair colored and you're like me going blonde, they tone it. They don't just put the blonde in and leave you going out the door yellow. They tone it to adjust the color to be the right way. That's exactly what we've done here. We've toned, <coughs> toned this down from super bright colors to making it look vintage. That is so cute. All right. Now, I think we're probably ready to buff the other pieces. Let's bring this over here. Let's move the glaze out of the way. I'm going to kind of rearrange some stuff because I want to put this down and be able to buff it without um, picking up any glaze by accident. Not that it'll stick, it's just going to make a smeary mess. So let me turn my paper over. There we go. Now you can use a terry cloth rag, you can use cheesecloth, you can and you know, back old fashioned, you've got shoe polish kit, you can go buff it with a brush. So what you do is you come in and you buff. And speed helps because speed creates a little friction that gets the shine, but it also melts the wax down into the surface. Look how beautiful that is. Let me see if I got any questions. Hey, Maddie is back again, and Priscilla and Gail, thank you. So here's where we're going with this. And I'm gonna zoom in. Okay. So if you see this now, it has this beautiful soft shine. Can you all see that? I'm looking at the camera. It's a little hard for me to tell if you can see that shine on there. I know I can catch it in the light, no problem. On the other side, it's dead dull, just totally dull. So on this side, I have this beautiful, soft, satiny shine. It's nice and smooth. It's hard. This side, dull as bone. So we're going to come back in. We're going to buff this side. Get the shine to pick up. Like I said, it, it liquefies the wax. It's polishes it, it brings it up to a nice satiny shine. Really lovely. And let me get the edges here. I don't, I'm not worrying about getting the shine on the edges. I just want to make sure I get the, the wax completely buffed and rubbed in. But 
But when I do it, I, I pick up a shine. I'm getting a shine right there. The bunny's little tail. I feel like I'm salting the bunny. So now we have this really, really, really pretty shine. Let me open this up again. See if I can get that in a way that you guys can. Yep. Now you can see that shine. Look how pretty that is. Dead doll before. Beautiful soft shimmer now. So we've got that one done. Then let's come to our egg. You gotta be careful how I say it. My grandmother was Pennsylvania Dutch. She used to say egg. And every once in a while, egg comes out of my mouth. Okay, so we've had this. We've got our dark wax around the edges. We've clear waxed it already. And let's start buffing. Oh, it's picking up the shine really nicely. You see, I'm picking up a little of the dark wax on my rag. This rag, too, will either need to be put in a can and sealed up or left out and put in a can with water or left to air out and remove all the solvents before I dispose of it because I don't. It can combust, too. You have to remember, solvent waxes are combustible. So again, I, you're going to get that kind of warning from me just because I don't want anybody to get hurt. And as you know, if you had a house burned down like I have, fire is an issue. I have, I've had space heaters in here all week, and every time I go home at night, after packing up some orders, I go around, not only do I turn off the space heaters, I unplug them, make sure the plugs are like three feet away from the wall, because, you know, somehow in my imagination, the space heater plugs are going to find their way back to the wall if they're not three feet from the outlet. But this is so pretty. Oh, I love this. I just like to be aggressive. I want to get that little bit of friction, makes the shine pop higher, makes the wax melt in tighter. Really nice. And if I needed to, I can come back in and put a second coat of wax. I don't need to, because I got the whole surface. It's kind of hard to miss most of the egg. But so here we go. We went from, and here's our little bunny guy. I'm not going to lay him down. This one, I can wax. I can top coat it. I will probably wax it uh, on Monday or Tuesday once it's dry. I need to give it enough dry time because if I try to wax over this now, I'm waxing on a damp surface. I will lift the paint. I will lift the glaze. Um, and I'll probably seal in moisture in a way that creates a really funky haze. I could even cause mold to grow under it. But look at this beautiful antique trio that we've created here. I am so pleased with these. And think of how cute any one of these in any combination would be in your house for Easter, in your yard, just because they're cute. You can do this on furniture. You can do it on wooden items. Don't hesitate to... I'm trying to get them centered because of the way the camera's sitting. Um, don't, don't hesitate to come up with different ideas. I mean, this was not hard. It's faux effects layering paint, a couple of different layers. Some of them we banged a few times with a rock. Some of them we ran through with our Baroque roller. Sand it, let it dry, sand it through, wax it up. How cute and easy. 
These are fantastic furniture finishes as well as finishes for crafts. I have done a ton of furniture with these, but I figured maybe if I showed them to you on a couple small craft items, it would seem a little less intimidating because if you can make these bunnies and this egg look this cute with this little effort, think of how fabulous a furniture piece would be. And your furniture does not have to be raw wood. This will work once you have cleaned and prepped your wood, cleaned your surface 100%. This will work over, uh, over painted wood. It will work over stained wood. You can do it over just about anything. We did this on stained wood. We actually stained the wood ourselves. So if this was a piece of furniture that was already this dark wood on it and we just wanted to kind of give it a whitewash color. Whoops, I didn't mean to, to do that. Hit it with my knuckle. Um, if you had a dark piece of wood and you just wanted to, um, piece of wood furniture and just wanted to, to whitewash it or pick a little, a little bit, look at how cute that is. Now again, we're looking at it, this is country, kind of a little bit coarse. We can get as sophisticated and clean as you want with it or as casual as you want it. So I am very, very pleased. I'm kind of getting a kick out of my bunny with the ring around it. So he almost looked like there's a cookie cutter in the center of it. Just cute as can be. So take advantage of the products. Take advantage of how easy these are. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. That's what I'm here for. I'm just going to kind of buff things. I can't buff that. Don't buff that, Maury. That's not waxed. I just love this. I just, I just love it. I think it probably looks the most messy sitting here on this piece of paper because the paper itself is dirty. But I just, just think about this like on your Easter table or in your garden. How cute would that be? Just loving this. And in your grandchild, your child or your grandchild's nursery. So cute. And then you could do the furniture to match. I am just thrilled, thrilled, thrilled. Now we did, I am not one to do red and pink often and I like how this looks. If I decide after it's dried, I want it darker, I can glaze it a second time. I can use dark wax on it. I might because I'm thinking maybe this pink is a little too pinky for me. So when it dries, I might come back after I clear wax this. I might do a little bit of that black Tudor wax on here and get something else going. You'll see when I'm finished with it. I'm going to clean the wax off of this brush. Oh, and here's the other thing. <laughs> If you notice, my brush says wax. If you're going to use a brush to wax your furniture, make sure you mark it wax and don't use it with anything else because you will screw up a paint job really, really fast that way. I promise you I've done it. Get some extra wax out of this brush because I don't want it depositing other stuff. And it'll, what I also, the reason I'm cleaning like this too, is if I leave wax deposited in this brush, the next job I come to wax, it, it won't leave a nice creamy haze on it. It'll chip out in little tiny bits and leave a nasty crumbly mess all over my surface. So you really, 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 really want to try to work the wax out of your brush before you put it away. Now this brush, because I don't, I've cleaned the wax out. I'm going to leave it open air. It will, the, uh, it's not going to be closed into anything and the fumes from the wax will dissipate and we won't have a combustion issue. All right, let me check and see if I have any questions. Yes, Kay, they are so, such a great idea for crafts. Thank you, Andrea or Andrea. I appreciate that. I have a friend named Andrea who spells it the same as Andrea. So I never know who I'm, how, which way you want to say. And Laura, thanks for popping in. Sharon, everybody. So let me flip the camera up one last time. I appreciate you all giving me your time today. I appreciate this. I'm just, I'm just loving this. I really am. I'm just so tickled with these. So tickled with these. And, you know, they kind of go with the bunny door stops that I did the, a couple weeks back when I came back from the UK. We were testing the new tester, the new primer. And by the way, no, the new primer is not in stock yet. We are still working out 
import export issues that take some time we're going to get it i promise you it's coming meanwhile don't forget we have the brand new roberson's paints we have all kinds of other wonderful products so shop paintedstudio.com for spring ideas these two dollars and fifty cents at michael's um, i doubt there are any left because i tried to get more and there weren't but remember when you're doing something you want to look vintage, don't forget these edges because the edges never look pretty on vintage stuff. They're far from perfect. A little choppy, a little beat up makes it perfect. Well, I can't, I'm using perfect in an imperfect manner. That's nothing new. But you want it to look handcrafted. If you get caught up on the words perfect and has to be a certain way, you're going to be very disappointed in your projects. Hand-painted items should look like they had a hand to them. Um, otherwise, they look machine-made. So you really want to think about just when you distress, how and where they need to be distressed, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think I'm rambling a little bit because it's the first time I've been warm and I'm actually getting a little sweaty. <laughs> So have a great Saturday, everyone. I will see you soon. I'm going to sign off now, and we are going to call it a day. Have a good one, everyone. Bye-bye.